thanks everybody. I think we'll get started. I think the lesson from this is you snooze, you lose. When because uh, <laughs> when, when Mark Teller doesn't show up for his own panel, I guess that means that uh, whoever's in the sport coat gets to take the moderator seat. So here I am. Uh, welcome. So yes, this is the software-defined storage panel, all about software-defined storage. Uh, just to give you kind of a bit of background about software-defined storage, if you look at the past decade, decade and a half in the data center, there's a very clear bias towards a few specific trends. Trends around open source, trends around virtualization, automation, agility in the data center. Um, but in all these trends, there's a very clear open source bias. And you saw this uh, manifest itself in the first place on the platform level and the virtualization level on the compute side. And the storage side has been kind of lagging. You haven't seen uh, the same level of uh, movement towards virtualization of storage. But over time, even that has taken place as the sort of economies of scale uh, that are present in the data center uh, take hold. And now we see it in storage as well. And now we've come to, even, you know you've arrived when there's a term that defines what you do. And in this case, it's called software-defined storage. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, announce, I guess the panelists will introduce themselves. So I want you to tell who you are, who you work for, and why you are on this panel. Let's start at the far left. Let's start with uh, Awadi. Hi, uh, I'm Anand Awati. I work for Red Hat. Um, I'm the uh, lead architect for GlusterFS and uh, I'm also the lead contributor. So I'm here because I work on GlusterFS. Uh, my name is Sage Weil, um, founder and CTO of Ink Tank, and I'm one of the chief architects and original creators of the Ceph distributed storage system. And I'm here because I just found out about 20 <laughs> minutes ago that I'm apparently I'm on a panel and nobody told me, so. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody did, got me in downstairs even did, though did I Did you say wrong. you're one of the chief architects of Ceph? I, I guess I'm the chief, I don't know. Okay, I, yeah. <laughs> I think you're being a little modest there, that's okay. That's, that's me. Uh, my, name, my name is Joe Arnold. I'm the CEO and, and uh, one of the founders of a company called SwiftStack. Um, and we do OpenStack ob open Swift, the object storage system, and uh, build a product around that. Um, I think the reason why I was at this panel is, so I put a book together called uh, Software Defined Storage with OpenStack Swift. And uh, uh, we're going to be giving away some copies tomorrow during lunch. Uh, Autograph copies. If you want. <laughs> So we have the guy who wrote the book on software-defined storage. I think we can all go and home now, right? And the, yeah, and then, and the, yeah, and then we're going to tear apart the term, I'm sure, through this <laughs> session. All right. Uh, my name is John Griffith. I work for a company called SolidFire. Um, we actually do a clustered uh, storage appliance that's actually designed specifically for software-defined storage. So I have some maybe different or maybe similar views about that. So we'll hopefully get into that. Hopefully, yeah. And I have not written a book, but I'd be happy if you want to buy one. I you know, crank one out tonight. And <laughs> there you go. Uh, just to give, get kind of an idea of where you stand with um, uh, cloud storage in general, uh, raise your hand if you are an end user or operator of cloud storage. Uh, sorry, yeah, operator or deployer of cloud storage services. Okay, fair number of you. Uh, how many of you are developers that work with uh, developing apps that use cloud storage services? Okay, and how many of you are here just because you're interested or you're blogging or you're a pundit? Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Some of you raised your hands for all of those. I'm gonna <laughs> um, okay, I just want to get an idea. Um, so let's start with, uh, let's define what it is. It's, it's great that we can say that we're converging around software-defined storage, but what does that actually mean? And I, I, you get the, when you look at announcements over the last you know, few weeks or months, you can see lots of companies are now jumping on the term software-defined storage. And does it actually mean the same thing depending on you know, the origins of the press release of whoever is making a, a particular announcement? So let's, why don't we start with our illustrious panel, our esteemed panelists, and see whether there are any differences in their definitions of software-defined storage. Um, who, who wants to take the first crack at, at defining it? What, what is it? Can we, can we say for sure? <laughs> <laughs> you asked for that. Sorry. I, no, <laughs> I asked for it. Okay. So I, for us, it's 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 about decoupling the software the software out of that physical hardware and putting it onto systems that just run that software and push data to physical drives. Um, and I mean, we're just to kind of bring the point home. We're like we started working with. Uh, uh, Seagate on this kinetic drive platform and you plug it in and it's an ethernet drive. And what that means is we can have compute nodes 
and all it is, is or sorry, storage nodes, and all it is is hard drives. And then you have the storage part, the storage application, in this case Swift, is just running in on compute nodes. And that's a complete decoupling of the software from the storage hardware. Um, and I, I think that's kind of a manifestation of what software-defined storage is. Um, I mean, we think that there's also, there's some control elements and access elements that we probably get into a little bit later, but that, that in my mind is what software-defined storage is. But that, I wouldn't call it a decoupling, that's more of a coupling, isn't it? I mean, isn't it more yeah. of a convergence of hardware and software, and now it's like... Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's no more different than writing blocks down into, into a drive, right? That's, now there's an OS already on your drive that's able to suck in blocks. What's the difference between sucking in objects? So, so that sort of begs the question, what is software-defined? That's storage? a really good, <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> All right. So maybe I should have written a book. <laughs> um, so in, in, in my view, in my opinion, um, there's, a, there's a big difference between the device um, and the actual product that you're using versus software-defined storage. Software-defined storage to me is about the management layer, uh, the control layer, and stuff like that. Um, it doesn't really matter what your, your product is that you're using to an extent. Um, the point is, software defined is a pool of virtualized storage resources um, so that you can go ahead and manage that, select it, deploy it, everything else. That's kind of the big thing in my mind. Um, so Fair enough. Uh, any uh, opinions on the, on the other side of the panel? Uh, sure. Um, so I think in, in my mind, you have sort of the, the, the high level storage interface that you're presenting to to users, the actual storage service that you're consuming, and the high level requirements are things like availability, uh, performance, and reliability. And then you have systems that are built out of, you know, obviously low level building blocks like disks, um, but they don't provide all those things because they can fail. And so you have all this stuff in between that's, for, that's essentially creating all the value in your storage system that's, you know, managing the replication and the performance and the data layout and so forth. And, and typically in traditional devices that you buy, you know, this is all packaged up in a nice piece of tin with some logo on the front, and that and is ridiculously expensive, even though it's built out of commodity components. So it's that, it's that sort of middle layer that's providing the real value um, in the system. Um, and so in my mind, what software-defined storage means is that you can, you can deliver that, that value. You can build a system that actually handles all that complexity of reliability and replication and so forth, um, but you can build it out of any building blocks that you want. Because the system really is built out of software, but but as we move into sort of the, the new world, instead of having to buy a monolithic proprietary platform from different vendors, um, we can use open source software and we can deploy deploy systems that have deliver that same value on any hardware. Um, so I think a, a piece of that is is going to be the sort of the management layer that you can you can manage these systems with generic APIs and so forth. But I think that's really just one piece of it. I think the other piece is that the, the value in the system um, can is hardware agnostic. So you can run it on top of you know, the kinetic drive, you can run it on top of SATA drives, you can run on SSDs. Um, but it's really that the software that's defining that value um, and you know, delivering the system. So isn't that more software-based storage as opposed to mine? Software-based storage yeah, as I mean, opposed to storage systems defined. are software and hardware, yeah. right? So I think, <laughs> I think software-defined storage is kind of a, a nebulous kind of useless term, That's honestly, in my opinion. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, for me, I think what, what the, the real, I mean, people have sort of glommed onto this term, software-defined storage, yeah. but I think that, that the real transition that's happened is they've realized that the value in their storage system is the software. And it's, it's, it's no longer the, the old world where you had to go, um, go to NetApp and it was uh, some secret sauce that you would just buy. Um, whereas today, you can, you can go, you can buy, get Gluster, you can run Ceph, you can run Swift, you can run all these um, sort of open platforms that deliver that, that value, but you can run it on any hardware that you want. So why do you think there is a movement towards, you know, the software side of things? What's, what's the value in it for the end user, for the customer? What, why is this, you know, happening? Um, so, I mean, it's things like escaping vendor lock-in. Um, it's things simple, it's, uh, you know, the, the simple cost advantages. Of, I mean, I, I think they're, they're adopting it because they have to, right? And, and that's, I mean, we, yeah. we look at like Marquita Libre is, is in the audience right now and they have to deliver a ton of images out to their customers to support their, their auction service. And the only way they can really do that to build up a system that can scale and they can manage it is, is by using something that allows them to overlay their, their, their infrastructure with another interface that is presented to the application. And I think, I think the driving force behind this is really how, how applications 
are the nature of applications are changing. You're seeing much more software as a service applications out there, and that consolidates the amount of storage that is needed in the data center um, just to support the concurrency workloads and the storage footprint. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of, well, we have to change it because scaling silos for that type of data assets just doesn't work anymore. So then do you think it's fair to say that without, you know, cloud workloads and big data workloads that the whole software-defined storage thing may not have been such uh, a high priority for, for end users? I, you know, when you start having a petabyte cluster and you, and, in, <laughs> and suddenly you're measuring, let's say you're like, like uh, who uses Evernode, right? And so, okay, so when they started using the, building their application, I mean, they home rolled their own storage system. Be, and this was like, I don't know, whenever they started their online service. And they did that because the, 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 pr the pricing model that they had for their customers, so subscription rates, didn't allow for them to buy anything else. They had to do something that was outside of the norm. Okay. I mean, I, I always like to say that it's not, you know, it's not necessarily how big your data is, it's what you can do with it. You know, it, it's like uh, data in, in place, just because you can store a lot of it, doesn't necessarily mean anything. It's, it's about whether or not you can actually put it to work and doing what you need to do to, to feed to your services. It, it seems like um, the scaling is, is really a forcing function. So I think there's a correlation because it's, it's easy to ignore a single expensive thing, but at the point where you're scaling, you suddenly have a thousand expensive things and the, the cost effectiveness of your solution becomes very apparent. Okay. You gotta play it for the well, other, yeah, other so, so I'm gonna quit making jokes about the working <laughs> stuff, but, um, well, I guess that's good. So, yeah. so the, uh, the thing is, I think we're kind of mixing kind of what we're talking about, right? Are we talking about software-defined storage, or are we talking about software-based storage and open source storage and things like that? Um, they're, they're not the same thing? No, they're not <laughs> okay. the same thing. They're very different discussions. Um, the thing about software, you know, and again, maybe my opinion is, is different. I, I couldn't tell. You, you know. Oh, I, I'm so, the moderator. I'm not supposed to have Right, that's right. Okay. <laughs> so the, the thing is, from my perspective, what you're, again, like I said, what you're talking about is you're talking about deployment and management and things like that. Um, you know, Sage, you had talked about vendor lock-in and, and things like that. Well, that's kind of the beauty of software-defined storage, right? So the idea is if the products that are underneath are granular enough and virtualized enough and robust enough, you can put whatever you want back underneath there. Um, you have a common API outside. You have that virtualization, that deployment model and everything done outside. So it's basically, it's more of an abstraction. Um, th the key, though, is you have to have a device that will actually let you do that and, and give you the features and the granularity and the control and everything else that you need to actually do that. And that's the hard part, in my opinion. I mean, let's, um, why don't you want to say? Yeah, um, another, uh, a few of the common themes you would um, see in, in, in most of the software defined storage, what we're seeing, one, as he already mentioned, it's, it's the scale. Uh, I guess if our data sets never grew uh, large enough um, and, and wouldn't fit in the same box, we would probably um, you know, not even be talking about such a field. Um, pretty much every software-defined um, storage system is, is, a, is a scale out system. Uh, if, if you're just talking about things in one box, you know, they're, they're I mean, wh why make it software-defined storage? Um, it's only when, when the scale grows so large and you need to deploy so many of these. Um, you, you look at things like using commodity hardware, um, you know, taking away the logic from one appliance and implementing it as, um, you know, as, as, a, as a piece of software. And that's when um, you also have this other correlation um, with respect to most of them being open source because now that everything is, is, is software, you can have a community around building software and, and, you know, and the open source model has, has proven to be you know, good at, good at, um, at, at, at building um, software systems more than building um, an integrated appliance. So I heard two things there. I heard one, that software-defined storage implies scale-out architecture. And I also heard that scale-up architecture does not necessarily necessitate software-defined storage uh, overlay. So any, any opinions? I, I have an opinion on that. I okay. mean, I think that's properties of the storage systems, not necessarily properties of software-defined storage. I mean, I think, like, the model that we ha we've chose is more of a, uh, like, the eventual consistency model, which gives us the ability to do things like asynchronous replication across multiple sites. It's a very different, it's a hugely different than like what you guys do. Um, I mean, it's just completely different workloads, but are we software defined storage and you're not just because, right. I mean, right. I, like it doesn't, I, I think there's, I think there's gonna be storage systems and they're gonna be software and 
they're all going to have different properties. Well, and the, and the, the reality is every storage system is software-based storage or whatever you want to call it. Every storage system, whether it's open source, proprietary, or whatever, it's software. I mean, they're all, it, it's all software, so it's kind of a silly, <laughs> it's kind of... <laughs> Well what, well, what constitutes non-software-defined storage, I guess? But in, in my mind, well, <laughs> I, in my mind, so, the, the definition is usually the, you know, the, the proprietary black box, the combined stack of hardware and software is, is usually what is the, is the counterpoint to yeah, the so, modern software. So I guess the thing storage. is, is that goes back to, to, to where I started, right, is um, the product is not software-defined storage. That's, that's not it. Software-defined storage is, is, is a concept. Right, it's software as a service, networking as a service, uh, compute as a service. Right. Um, so, so from my viewpoint, the way I look at it, right, Cinder is software-defined storage. None of us sitting up here and what we're talking about, in my opinion, are software-defined storage. We develop products that are are better or or you know specific for software-defined storage, um, but we are not. That's not software-defined storage. That that's what my position is. Okay. Any uh, audience uh, questions or, uh, uh, yeah, uh, you in the back? That's kind of my take. I don't know if that's necessarily. Like, how do you understand insights compared to general understanding of the concept? Because, I think that's. You know, we talk about software-defined networks. I can understand that, right? That's most, mostly when people tell me white box is trust mode network based and that's why that. And I realize that that's not really what it is. Like, it's 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 I certainly have that opinion. So we'll take a box, we'll put Linux on it, whether that's Red Hat, CentOS, Ubuntu, and then uh, and then the drives will slot in there, and we'll 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 manage those drives and then present an object storage interface out to to whom the storage user. And so if someone slots in, slots in uh, storage from a different uh, manufacturer, and it's slower, then we'll put less data on there, or less user requests on there. If it's faster, we'll put more user requests on that, and that's just kind of a function of how, how our, our, this OpenStack Swift in particular works. I mean, I think you're looking at the like a, a group of panelists that have those types of products, right? I mean, they, we all have our respective products that yeah. You see, you, you see know. companies popping up all the time yeah. that you could call white box vendors that slap on software on top of it yeah. and sell it. Yeah, and that happens all the time. Yeah. I think a good thumb rule to to um, to check if a given solution is a software defined solution or not is whether you can run it on absolute commodity hardware. If if the solution requires some form of very specific hardware, if it has a dependency on a hardware from some vendor, that by definition kind of disqualifies it from being called a software-defined storage. You need to be able to build it. Typically, they are scale out, and you need to be able to build them from commodity off-the-shelf components completely. Uh, you, can, you can choose to use you know, 15K RPMs, 7200 RPM, SSDs, depending on your performance needs, but the, the service what you deliver should be mostly agnostic to the specific hardware itself and should just exploit the that available. Kind of, that kind of gets into tiering, which I want to get into later, but you have a, wait, hang on. Do you, you have a response to that? Well, well, no, I mean, I'm not Seagate, I'm SwiftStack, right? So but we just happen to be working <laughs> with those guys, right? 
But, but, but the, I mean, I'm just talking about some of the future technologies coming out in the roadmap ahead, right? More than like this is the only thing we run on. Um, but I would, I would agree that it's important to be to to be able to to install on a lot of different hardware platforms. But the reality is, we get out into the field, it kind of gets important what kind of hardware is the stuff is running on, and um, and and you know, and to that end, I think all of us will make recommendations for here's here's a recommended hardware that you should use. Like we have a thing, we're like we're working with Intel right now on a set of workloads and then, you know, what kind of hardware you would need to support those workloads. And so it's not like it can just run on any old JBODs. In fact, sometimes the storage is not a JBOD. That's right. not enough power to really run a storage system because you need a lot of compute capacities to do what, like Sage was talking about, route around the failures because hardware, when, when, when things go bad. So. It's not just any old stuff. Probably way more complicated than this than I no. Can I, can I ask a sort of a, I know this is not a rhetorical question, but a question. Um, when people are talking about software-defined networking, and what is the difference between software-defined networking and virtual networking? Or could you just say that software-defined, these services are really providing virtualized networks? Like is that, am I, is that sort of a, Valid comparison. Well, I mean, I, I think with um, software defined, you're shaking your head. Is it, software defined, I'm, like I'm, 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 I'm a Neanderthal when it comes to networking, but I'm just trying to. Control. Yeah, control. Over the yeah, okay. yeah, okay. correct. And I'm not so, that yeah. Yeah, that's the type we have. I mean, we have a whole product around control of the S software defined storage system, right? So Swift will just run and do its thing. But our opinion is that you need to have a controller that goes in and manages the data play, like tell, hey, there's new capacity in the system, go take advantage of it. Hey, there's new users, go, you know, provision them. Things like that we think comes from a controller component. Okay, we're getting a lot of uh, questions from the audience now. So you, you, and then you. So you yeah. first. That, that's, that sounds like the perfect question to end the panel on. So I'm going to save that one for the very end, if, if you don't mind. I can tell you what we do, what we, what, what we don't do. Yeah. Right, right, right. So you, you had a question back. Sure, and, and that begs the question of, is it just the API, or is, 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 does the API define the storage, or is it more than that? And that so that, I think that's a good uh, question. I want to open that up to the, the yeah, panel. I think, I, think it's, um, I think there's sort of two things that we're talking about here. And one of, them, one of them is this generic API control layer that you use software to orchestrate storage. And because you have, I, this is, what, this is what, um, what you're talking about. And this is, this is what, if you go read you know, the, all the propaganda around, not propaganda, whatever, the, the press around EMC's <laughs> Viper, for example. This is, EMC is a very traditional like, enterprise storage expensive array. <laughs> and, and the Viper layer is really just about configuring the, the traditional storage layer. So that, I think that this is a very good thing, I think, in general, having, sure. having software control and orchestration and so forth. Um, I don't know that I would call it software-defined anything. I would call it software orchestrated storage, perhaps. Um, but then there's a totally separate sort of discussion where you have systems like, like Swift and Gluster and Ceph that are really saying that the, the storage system itself, the, really, the smarts that actually make it useful, um, that virtualize your storage services from the, the hardware that's underneath, um, that that's really changing you know, the, the face of the, the industry and so forth. So I think, so, and that I think is something, it's a totally different thing than, than orchestrating storage. It's, it's, you know, it's open, open. Yeah, it's a data path versus the control right. path. I mean, that's. So I, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that as soon as you start talking about software-defined X, it's really a lot of software-defined bullshit. <laughs> and that you're, you're going to be better off if you, if you 
I think, honestly, I think the, the community and everybody, everybody wants to say that their X is software-defined storage because they can sort of piggyback on this term. Um, but I think we'd actually be better off if we, if we had like sort of more precise terms that describe what we're actually talking about, whether it's software or- You want clarity storage. in marketing? What? Wait, yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> or, but what yeah. you just did was, was actually just muddied that whole definition even more. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you, just, you just took something like software-defined storage as, you know, like I said, I, I use the example, since we're all at the OpenStack Summit, right? Cinder as being, uh, delivering software-defined storage, um, which I think is, is pretty reasonable, and, and there seems to be a few people, at least, that, that had that, you know, when we talked about networking and things like that. But now what you're saying is you're taking it back down to the product. Um, so, so then I'll, I'll go back and I'll say, well, my product runs on commodity hardware as well, um, and then we just put software on it. So we're, by your definition, then we're in, in the club too, right? So well, what, what I'm saying actually is that because of this confusion, I think we should stop saying software-defined storage, but we should use a different term that is that is more specific. For which one, though? For both. Honestly, for both. I think that hmm. I think that it, I think that we should say software orchestrated storage. It talks about things like Cinder so or storage Viper or, or storage as a service. I think that these are, these. That yeah, it's it's clear what you're actually talking the about. Other SaaS. And then when you start the talking other. about these, um, <laughs> you know, these these open source architectures that are, you know, run on commodity hardware, you can sort of plug in any storage yeah. underneath. Um, then I think you can. If we, I don't know what the term for that is. Um, that's 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 my that's my opinion. Well. I think even, even there, there's some confusion because in my mind, when I think software-defined networking, I'm thinking about people defining you know, a virtual networks and then that being tunneled through various technologies um, on commodity switching infrastructure. Um, but other people, it's a, to them, it's a common API that then configures their storage hardware to do the same thing, but in so, hardware, so. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm ignoring the open source piece, but right. I'm, I'm saying it's, it's almost virtualized versus the API. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe I'm in a minority. So, so you think in terms of I'm the, with you. You think, <laughs> you think of a control and orchestration API is what you're thinking? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I did too, by the way. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, did, did we have a question over here? Yeah. Okay. I think he's he's chomping at the bit too. <laughs> so I don't. It, it, I'll try and be quick. Just, just take but, it. <laughs> so from from my perspective, I think the big thing that drives it is um, automation and management. Period. Um, the reality is, uh, you know, it's there's vendor lock-in. That's an issue. Management, um, APIs, automation, all that sort of thing. Um, managing storage is not fun. It sucks, right? So if you can abstract that out and have it software defined, it's great. The other thing is is you can do things like if you have a device, an array or whatever, and it is completely full and you need more space or whatever, it doesn't matter because if you have software defined, you know, API control, you can go ahead and just deploy a volume somewhere else um, and it doesn't matter. Um, you can keep adding devices. You can scale it horizontally. So that's, that's my take. Anybody want to respond to that? So, so to, your, to your point uh, earlier, you know, if I, if I take, you know, some basic file system some white box and a couple of hard drives and I install XFS on it, is that software-defined storage? I mean, you would say no, and I, I would kind of say no as well, but what's the difference between that and some of the other things we're talking about up here? I mean, it seems like there's a, yes? Sure. Well, that gets back to your original question about what are the limitations in our product, okay. Um, Uh, 
I, I think my, uh, the, only, my, the point I was trying to make is it's just we're all going to have customer, like with, within OpenStack, like OpenStack object storage, it's serving the needs of for that use case, right? And so some of those features are going to be unique to that storage system. We're all going to have different types of capabilities and, uh, and different APIs, and we're going to get consumed in different ways. And yeah, I mean, I, that, that's going to be the difference between, I think, all of our different takes on what software-defined storage is. Yeah, I mean, I think if we want to double click into the, like the technology, how it works. I mean, like uh, Thursday, we'll do a we'll do the thing on global, global clusters with Concur, for example, and you can hear about how that in particular works, right? Um, um, but I but I think that's that, that's my point is like everything's gonna every different storage system has different properties to it, and uh, so if we, if we want to get into sort of like what the individual uh, pieces do, why don't we take turns on the panel and talk about? what each of us work on and how it delivers software-defined storage and what it doesn't deliver uh, as far as part of, you know, in answer to your question, but also adding in the part of how do you deliver software-defined storage and then what are you lacking? Why don't we just go from uh, left to right and uh, uh, can, we, can we add one more thing now that we have confused it enough? Yeah. How, how important is on-demand? I mean, we talked about reliability, we talked about high availability, but on-demand and elasticity, we sort of talked about scale up, but how about scale down? I mean, how important is that to Multi-dimensional definition of uh, software-defined storage. Okay, <laughs> sure. Um, do you want to add that? I guess we are uh, at that point. We are probably kind of. Uh, we have four minutes, so whatever it is, let's say. Yeah. yeah, we are pr probably overlapping with the abilities of a particular solution, but um, but I guess um, part of the part of the value of pulling things out from a specific appliance and into the software layer is that you get all these benefits of you know flexibility automation things like that um, um, should be you know i guess it's it's more expected from a software defined storage system to have those abilities but then what are the and then what are the limitations of as far as the project you work on now what are, what are, what is what does it not do i guess in this area well, I guess there are, are um, there are a few things wh which are in our um, roadmap. For example, um, one of the things which is not there in Glass today but is in um, development is active active geo replication. Uh, we've been able to do unidirectional um, geo replication to you know uh, scaling out geo replication, cascading geo replication for nearly two years now, but um, now we're adding the ability to do bi-directional uh, geo-replication with uh, policy-based conflict resolution. So in a way, um, you know, being software, uh, having everything in the software layer, one would expect us to you know, deliver such features, on, which, yeah, which is not there yet, but is, is coming down the road. Okay, we need to yeah, roll through the panel. Right. Um, so uh, I guess, I'll the project, obviously, I work on is Ceph. Um, I think that the, the key value um, is really in being able to scale up and scale out. Um, as you need more storage resources, you just deploy more disks and sort of add them into the storage pool. Um, I guess that the way I would describe that is either virtualized storage, where you, you have a virtual disk or something, and, in, and you're deploying you know, racks of storage and all the replication and so forth is handled. That includes scale down and so forth. I don't know if you call that virtualized storage or whether you call that software-defined storage. Honestly, I don't really care about about the terms. I think that the, the sort of the second piece that we're talking about here is having the sort of generic API orchestration layer, and I think also that's that's tremendously value, valuable, don't get me wrong. Um, I think it's difficult for any particular vendor to say that I deliver a generic API that can manage <laughs> lots of different sources, systems, um, but I think that, you know, both are, both are very valuable, so I don't care what you call it. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. so what, uh, so Swift is good at high concurrency, High durability um, is architected for availability. It does not do um, high concurrence, or sorry, it doesn't do strong consistency. So, if you want to run a virtual machine on it, you don't do that. Um, if you have 
a lot of data to store and you have a lot of transactions to send data in and out or you have a globally distributed footprint, it's a good model for eventual consistency and that's what Swift is specifically designed to deal with. Um, so with the confusing definitions, I guess I'll, I'll talk about SolidFire's product and what it does. Um, so we are uh, scale out high availability, high availability um, virtualized block storage. Uh, it allows you to do things like set quality of service on a volume per volume basis. Um, we have multi-tenancy awareness, um, things like that. So from our viewpoint, when I go into that definition that I gave of software defined storage, that's why it's a, a good fit. Um, things that we don't do well, um, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> no, we, uh, we, you know, we're a new company, we're a startup. Um, so we've we've got growth and we've got things on the roadmap. Um, so there's there's things that we need to do, but you know, I, I think the first question is to figure out exactly what we're defining here because <laughs> it's hard to really <laughs> speak to it. Without okay, so, so on on that note, uh, how many of you think that software-defined storage as a term is a is, is a load of bunk? Like there's nothing to it. A bunch of hype. <laughs> <laughs> is that the is that the takeaway lesson from today? How many you think well, it's there's actually there's real? There's a real substantive. There's a real thing. There. There, I think there are multiple real things happening. <laughs> I'm afraid we didn't help define it any better than we had before. So. We're, go we're going from refrigerators to storage systems that we can get from a bunch of, diff bunch of different vendors. Whatever you want to call that, it's real and it's happening. Well, and I think Sage is, I think what Sage said as far as the, the two categories and stuff like that, I mean, in my opinion, that's, that's perfect. That sums it up. And, we get a, and on that note, we're going to have to end it. But thank you to our illustrious panel. Thank you for coming. Thanks. Thanks, thanks so much.